Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Remember to like and subscribe and vote in the poll for a better roommate next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Scott Pilgrim from the graphic novel and movie Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. It's one of my favorite movies even if Scott is an absolute turd of a human being. Really, it's just a testament to how solid the movie is. Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need to rock individually, and maybe that'll help you rock as a group later on. Next, we need to be one of the greatest fighters in all of Toronto, or the spine of the world. I think that's the Faerun equivalent of Canada. Finally, we'll get the power of understanding, which is a sword that we pull out of our chest when we realize that we're the jerk who's ruining our life. For stats, we're using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep your charisma and one of your physical stats high enough for multi-classing. Charisma will be number one, you're a decent bassist, and have a magnetic quality you don't deserve. Strength next, you're a heck of a brawler, ripping off your style from your favorite Street Fighter fighters. Actually, they might be more dexterous. Dexterity after that, Scott is just as quick as he is strong. We could have flipped these if we wanted to. Follow that up with Constitution. A lot of your fights come down to you getting punched until you figure out the gimmick. Intelligence is a bit low, you're real dumb, but wisdom is the dump stat. Scott is a bad listener, borderline narcissist, and I'm pretty sure he never performed surgery. You can't be a monk with dumped wisdom, or at the very least, you can't multiclass into monk, which makes this one of the trickier builds we've done because if Scott has a positive wisdom modifier, he is no longer Scott. Speaking of things that aren't Scott, Asimar, Bugbear, Goliath, Homecoming, One, Freight Car. But humans can be Scott, and variant humans can be better Scott, because they get feats. Since we can't have our constitution quite as high as I'd like, let's grab the tough feat. This will give you plus 2 HP for every level you have, and every level you get. I actually kind of like this, as it basically bumps up your constitution score without helping you for checks and saves. Even though you can take a beating, you'll get drunk off of a couple of GNTs. Bump your charisma and your dexterity with your two free points. Take sleight of hand for your skill of choice in case you need to make someone lose vegan edge, and modify the entertainer background for deception and performance proficiency, because hey, you're in a band and you betray people's trust regularly. Speaking of that, stick around to see some bard levels, but we'll start off with fighter levels. First level fighters can choose two skills of their choice. Athletics and acrobatics will help you get your physical skills. For your fighting style, unarmored fighting from the class feature variants, Unearth Arcana lets you deal 1d6 with your unarmed attacks or 1d8 with two free hands. You can also deal 1d4 when you grapple someone and an extra d4 when you attack someone you've grappled. This is how you can be a punch person without being a monk person, because your wisdom is bad, because you're kind of a bad person, but you're learning, or at least I hope you are. There's also Second Wind, which lets you heal 1d10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action. Eventually, you're gonna have to fight twins, and that's twice as hard. It might seem weird not to start off as a bard, but you still get an extra skill from bard when you multi-class in later, and it's a good idea to start with big hit die class with level one if you're gonna multi-class later, which we're gonna do later. Second level fighters get Action Surge, letting you make two actions instead of once in the same round once per short rest. You're pretty tenacious for a guy in a band, even if we don't have any bard levels just yet. We still won't at third level because I want to pick a martial archetype from the third level of fighter champion gives you improved critical, letting you critically hit on a 19 or 20. I'm not sure how much damage it takes to turn someone into coins, but I'm guessing it's a critical hit. We're actually here because champions get a second fighting style later, so we don't have to multi-class into another martial class. I promise, bard levels are coming in a second, but now we've got an ability score improvement, so fourth level fighters get an ability score improvement. You can use this to bump up your strength score for bigger punches, kicks, and headbutts, really any part of your Canadian body you feel like hitting someone with. Fifth level fighters get extra attack, letting you make two attacks instead of one with your action. I, I promise we're gonna start multi-classing, but come on, extra attack is so good. Okay, and we're close to another ability score improvement. So sixth level fighters get another ability score improvement right Right now, strength is what we need to make sure that we can beat the four deadly axes. Wait, there are seven? That's so many, that's the same number of levels of fighter as we have. Starting now, when we hit seventh level of champion, making you a remarkable athlete, which lets you add half your proficiency bonus to strength, dexterity, and constitution checks that you're not proficient with, which does include initiative rolls. The evil exes ambush you pretty regularly, you gotta keep your head on a swivel. You can also add your strength modifier to the distance of a running long jump for the hopping ability of a certain Italian plumber. Giuseppe, he's my building super, he's a really nice guy, and he used to do the long jump in high school. We had a nice little chat while he was fixing our AC. Speaking of jumps, let's jump to the eighth level of fighter to cap off our strength because sorry, you can't use your charisma modifier for your punching attacks. There actually isn't a way to use charisma for weapon attacks. I mean, there's one way. 
but we're gonna have to beat Nega Scott. Or you can practice using your charisma modifier and just work things out peacefully. Hexblade Warlocks get to be Hex Warriors, letting you use your charisma modifier instead of your strength or dexterity with one weapon that isn't two-handed. Technically, a longsword isn't two-handed, it's versatile. Of course, you took proficiency with longswords instead of skateboards in grade five, so it should work out great, even though your strength is actually higher. Still, you can use Hexblade's Curse once for short rest to pick an X to absolutely wreck, adding your proficiency bonus to damage rolls and healing an amount of HP equal to your Warlock level and Charisma modifier when you turn them into coins. I'd say you could spend the coins on healthcare, but that's free in Canada. So presumably you just get extra money. Sweet, good for you. Hexblades also get cantrips and spells. Friends is the perfect pilgrim cantrip. It gives you advantage on charisma checks with a creature for a minute, but once it's done, they hate you and might seek violent revenge. Minor Illusion creates a visual illusion that fits into a five-foot cube or an audible illusion that can be as loud as a scream. So make a little fuzz rock or a little fuzz rock visage of a monster. It can be proven false with an investigation check against your spell save, but you're just doing it to make your show look cooler, so that's fine. For first level spells, Charm Person is like an upgraded version of Friends, forcing a wisdom saving throw of eight plus your proficiency bonus and charisma modifier on a creature, charming them for an hour if they fail with that trademark Michael Sarah charm. You might think he's a dork, but a huge percentage of my high school had a crush on him, so maybe you just have a high wisdom score or something? Thunder Wave isn't normally a warlock spell, but it was added to the warlock list in the class feature variants Unearth Arcana. Forces a constitution saving throw in a 15 foot cube in front of you, dealing 2d8 thunder damage to creatures that fail and pushing them back 10 feet, half as much if they succeed and no pushing. If you get into a base battle, you need to bring the base. Speaking of bringing the base, where are those bar levels, am I right? Not here, because this is the second level of Warlock, letting you pick invocations. Misty Visions will let you cast Silent Image at will. This creates a 15-foot visual illusion that doesn't make any sound, but your Sonic Yeti is made of sound, so just make a performance check behind it or use Minor Illusion since that's not concentration. Like Minor Illusion, Silent Image can be seen through with an investigation check, but again, you're just trying to put on a good show and one-up your girlfriend's DJ exes, if we're being honest. Armor of Shadows lets you cast Mage Armor on yourself at will. You don't really wear armor, but for unarmored defense, we'd need need monk levels, which means wisdom or barbarian levels, which just doesn't feel right. So mage armor, 13 plus dex, not bad, even though we're throwing it away next level, which isn't the bard level just yet. Third level warlocks get a Pact Boon, a gift from Negascot, so why not upgrade your hex weapon with Pact of the Blade? This lets you pull a sword right out of your chest as an action, it's magical, and it can be two-handed now. Hex Warrior specifically mentions it works with this, so you can get the Power of Understanding, which I'd call a great sword dealing 2d6 slashing damage. To make it better, throw Armor of Shadows away, because it really wasn't in character to begin with, and grab Improved Pact Weapon, which adds one to the attack and damage rolls with your Pact Weapon. For this level spell, we need a third chest sword option, so pick up Shadow Blade. Blade, which creates a weapon that deals 2d8 psychic damage, it's light and can be thrown 20 feet, then brought back to your hand as a bonus action, and if you're fighting in dim light or darkness, you have advantage. Even though this is a smaller sword, it's actually your best one, but it only lasts for a minute depending on your concentration. To quote Huey Lewis, that's the power of second level warlock spells. Fourth level warlocks get another ability score improvement. Charisma is pretty important for spells like Enthrall, which forces a wisdom saving throw on creatures within 60 feet of you that can be charmed. Failing that, they have disadvantage on perception checks to perceive other creatures. Very useful in case Knives and Ramona are sitting too close to each other. Fifth level warlocks can learn third level spells, but uh, don't. Just use the third level spell slots for a shadow blade that deals 3d8 psychic damage per hit, and you can grab Eyes of the Dark, which gives you 120 feet of dark vision that works in any kind of darkness. Clubs can be pretty dark and you need to rock in those clubs. Before we go over to Bard, I just want to grab a few more fighter levels. Ninth level fighters get Indomitable, letting you reroll a failed saving throw once per long rest. Hopefully you're not doubling up on X's in the same day. Using this on your Shadow Blade constitution saves would be a pretty good idea since you have proficiency with con saves from fighter to help you actually succeed and very few spell slots to cast that spell again. Though, no, don't sweat it too much, your packed weapon is a solid backup. Tenth level champions can choose another fighting style. I'd go with dueling for your Shadow Blade because it works with that, adding two to the damage of a weapon attack you're wielding one-handed, which can pair with your Hexblade's Curse and Strength modifier for a plus 12 damage modifier to all of your attacks with the expanded crit chance as well. Toronto is a big city. To be the best fighter there, you gotta be pretty dang good. 11th level fighters get another extra attack, meaning with an action surge and psychic blade, you can deal 18 D8 plus 72 psychic damage against a foe that you've hexbladed in one round. Aren't you glad you respect yourself? Acknowledging your faults makes you more powerful. Who'd have thought? 12 level fighters get another ability score improvement so you can cap off your charisma. When we eventually get to those bards levels, we're gonna need charisma for the casting, so it's gotta be working. But we're not quite as tough as Scott is yet, so let's take another fighter level for another use of Indomitable, Pearl 
long rest. Since you can use these on death saving throws, it's basically an extra life. Though really, if we want to be tougher, we should just get more constitution. One more level of fighter here for an ability score improvement. Keep in mind, bumping your constitution buffs your HP retroactively as well, meaning you're getting plus 19 HP here, not plus one. Oh shoot, 15th level of champion's really good. Let's just grab that super quick, it'll give you superior critical, meaning you crit on an 18, 19, or 20, and since your shadow blade has advantage in dim light, that's basically a 30% crit chance in the Dark Rock Clubs of Toronto. Alright, it's finally time for some bard levels. Oh no, we hit level 20. Oh no. I'm kidding. Obviously that was the real plan, I just figured people might click off a video if I said Scott wasn't a bard at the beginning. Bard would be a good class for Scott, it just can't get unarmed fighting, so we'd still need fighter levels. If we still want Shadow Blade, that means we'd either need 10 levels for Magical Secrets or to be a lore bard, which Scott is not. He hates libraries, they remind him of middle school. Sword Bard could pick up the fighting style early, but beyond a few charming spells, Scott doesn't really cast all that much. He sort of just hits things, gets hit by things, and pulls swords out of his chest. Jack of all trades also doesn't work for Scott because he's very bad at the things he's bad at. Really the only bard thing about him is that he plays an instrument, but not everyone who punches is a monk, not everyone who likes to read is a wizard, not every angry character is a barbarian, playing against type can be fun and can have its benefits. Plus, the idea of signing a pact with all of your repressed emotional issues to fight enemies with the power of trying to be a better person is just a cool build, don't at me. Playing against type has power benefits as well, which we'll talk about in the pros section. Your sword of the power of self-respect can pair with all of your fighter levels to deal absolutely insane damage that is all magical and psychic, one of the least commonly resisted damage types in the game. You're also loaded with charisma and charming spells to make things go your way. Finally, you've got a lot of HP, with somewhere around 200 depending on how you rolled. For weaknesses, you've only got two spell slots per short rest from Warlock, meaning if you break concentration on the Shadow Blade, it could be going bye-bye. You're also lacking wisdom, which is a super common saving throw and generally a pretty nasty one. Finally, the unarmed fighting isn't as good as your dueling fighting style thanks to Shadow Blade, and switching for something like defense would be more powerful to keep you safe even if you don't wear armor. By the way, Plate Mail Pilgrim could do this whole thing with 21 AC if you have a shield. But Plate Mail isn't who you are, and your power comes from understanding yourself, flaws and all. Grow up, make peace with your past, and strive to be better in the future. You're a good dude now, or at least you're working on it. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, subscribe for more. We make two videos every week. Join the Patreon at the $5 tier if you want character sheets. We're still getting caught up, but we're making six of them a week. You can also check out Tulak and Mango if you just want more Tulak fun.